Hi everybody. Really nice to be here, getting towards the end of term. Um, a little starter for you there. Four balconies. Imagine you're producing Romeo and Juliet and setting it in the present day. Which balcony would you use and why? So Jenny's come on straight away and said top left. Um, just want to say hello to those people who are joining us for the first time. Um, and obviously welcome back to those people who are with us all the time. Just a reminder here, if you've got any issues, I was going to say personal issues, obviously it isn't necessarily the place to share those. Um, if you've got any issues that are sound related or technology related, put them in the Q&A. Or if there's anything you'd specifically like a question on to do with your school or centre, then put them in the Q&A and somebody will answer them. The group chat is intended just for um, sharing ideas or comments or answering questions that I might ask. Okay, so if we do it that way, we'll be fine. So we've got bottom left. We've got something for everybody, actually, uh, there. We've got um, bottom left, top right. Um, I would probably go for top right, because I tend to think that Juliet might be a reader. I like to think that she would be a reader. Um, bottom left, interesting. I think bottom left is interesting, because it, it, it suggests a jutting out into the landscape, which I think is very symbolically true, perhaps, of the Capulet. So um, this is just a little starter activity, one I've used several times um, with varying pictures um, in terms of um, setting plays in the modern day, but just to get behind the kind of symbolism of it. So if they did choose the bottom right, why would they? Uh, what kind of family life does it represent, etc.? cetera? Um, somebody says, such an interesting question. Um, top, uh, top right seems to be winning, actually. I think it's the kind of slightly tweeness of it, perhaps. It's the um, coziness of it, as opposed to, uh, I would go for the conspicuous consumption. But anyway, there we go. Bottom left. Has anyone read Sweet Sorrow by David Nichols? This activity has reminded me of it. No, I haven't. I'll have a look at that. Jenny says, too cluttered. Mm, I don't think Romeo would do too well with a glass wall. No, you <laughs> Right, actually, and also it leaves fingerprints if he did come in the middle of the night, so Lord Capulet would be able to find him. Okay, so moving on. Um, weekly webinar 12, unbelievably. Um, best of literature, kind of like a greatest hits I'm going to do today, with a focus on catch-up activities, uh, recall activities. Okay, so let's look at what we're doing. The usual here, we're going to have a little check-in, update and feedback online resources, some literature resources, as I say, best of, then tea break, time to discuss, share and inspire. But before we do that, I'm just going to go to um, Liz from Pearsons, who's going to show you a slide and talk to you briefly about the Ofqual consultation. So over to you, Liz, and could we have the slide, please? Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone. Um, Liz here. As Many of you will be aware um, Ofqual have launched their consultation on summer 2021 today. Um, the consultation is open now for two weeks until the 16th of July and the outcomes will be announced in August. We don't have this specific date yet. I'm going to share with you a link to the consultation in the group chat. It's on the Ofqual website so please do go and have a good look at it. Um, Pearson will be responding um, and we encourage you all to have a look and respond as well um, and just to reassure you that we are working on how we would best support you across all of the different scenarios um, and we will keep you up to date as and when the outcomes are announced. Thank you Julie. Okay, thanks Liz. If we can go back to the main PowerPoint now, thank you. Obviously, I just want to reiterate there what Liz has said. Obviously, we'll, whatever is the outcome of it, we will be, we'll be here for you, as we have, I think, throughout the lockdown with these weekly webinars, which I hope has sort of kept you, give you something to look forward to and giving you lots of ideas. But just to stress that we know no more than you do. So could we have the original slides back, please, now? Thank you. Lovely. So let's move on. Right, what I thought I'd do today, because this is the last literature one before the summer, because next week is our diversity conference, then it's the last week that we're doing the 16th. So I thought I'd just actually put, these are literally taken, copied and pasted, feedback, what's wanted. So I was going to go through and tell you, if I've covered them already, you might not have been with us before, you can go back and get them from a previous webinar, because they're all on our website. 
So somebody asked for non-linear approaches for a scheme of work for refitting learners. Now, I'm going to look at that. I've put next week, but what I mean is the week after, because next week is our diversity conference. So I'll be doing language then. Um, advice on exams, as soon as we know, we'll tell you. Uh, modeling via online learning. Um, we do have some PowerPoint lessons that are on our website. And if you have a look at the Team English National Conference, which I'll give you a link for in a little moment, um, you'll see that I am, I've done a whole presentation on how to do a PowerPoint lesson, which helps for online learning, so you can access that. Um, comparing poems in an effective way, I'm going to do a bit today. I'm planning a poetry comparison. Um, planning assessments to reduce teacher workload. I did talk about multiple choice questions, and I did that in webinar number 11. So if you want to look back at that one. Um, generally, more ideas about approaching text in an innovative way. Um, I like to think um, this session might have a few ideas, so hopefully. And then somebody asked for anything Key Stage 3 would be great, especially for reluctant writers. And I just wanted to say that webinar 3, I covered Key Stage 3 in quite some detail. I gave a whole kind of um, lesson idea there. Um, and we're going to do a poll, however the ta tackling catch-up work, we're going to do a poll later about that. Um, so in a moment, OK? So hopefully you get some more information then. So I hope that's helped, just to know that we do take your feedback seriously. And now, here you are. Here is the poll. So if we can have the, the chat boxes up. What, if any, catch-up are you offering in the summer? And I mean that across the board, Key Stage 3, etc. And what are you offering Key Stage 3 at the moment? OK, so just it would just be interesting to see what everybody's doing and what their schools are doing. And I will actually put in there what mine is doing as well. You may not have planned. Rosa says we aren't. I'd say that's, a, that's an interesting, my school hasn't planned anything either. Again, Laura, we're not. Nothing here. Still awaiting news. Um, key stage three, full teaching timetable using virtual lessons. Yeah, Laura says nothing. Um, Jenny says we're sending students away with a hard copy of what they've missed. Good idea. No marking. Yeah. I think there needs to be an acceptance that we need a summer holiday because we have been working. Nothing during the holiday. That's interesting. It seems to be a resounding nothing. Nothing yet. And for key stage three, worksheets, home learning, split between online. Last day today, lucky you, Nick, gave them reading guidance. OK. Oh, that Sarah says we're creating a website area for inspector calls where students can access resources they may have missed. Good idea. Rosa says we need a break to reevaluate and assess. I totally agree. Things may have changed by September. We don't know. And, and the guidance for schools only came out today, so we need time to work on that. OK, so just another minute on that if you just want to get your any and just finish typing what you are typing. Booklets seem to be a good one. I think if I'd known what I know now at the very beginning of lockdown, I think I would have just done booklets for, for everything. But obviously there wasn't time to sort it out. A lot of people created uh, VLEs, yeah. And Jenny says we've full online lessons. That's interesting. OK, so let's close that down now. Thank you. That was interesting to see what people are, are offering. Thank you. So let's look at some things I found online. Here's what I mentioned earlier, the Team English. If you do follow people on Twitter, um, Team English is a really good place to start. They had a, the last two years, they had a very, very big live um, conference. Their last one last year was in Peterborough. And they had a lot of speakers. It was very, very well attended. And here, they have decided they've ch ch changed it to online for this year. Now, they've done it in quite an innovative way. It starts tomorrow, I'm oh, sorry, Saturday morning. And I think at 10 o'clock, they're going to give a Zoom. Yes, it says there, Zoom link at 10 o'clock, 500 people, first come, first serve. But that, I stress, is only for the opening live uh, talks, OK, the live launch. All their actual conference um, packages will be available for the whole of the weekend on their website. So if you want to, to go on to that, there's an awful, awful lot of very interesting speakers. I've got a session. I'm doing a session on how to create a PowerPoint online learning resource. So that's interesting. And there's loads of others. There's some really interesting talks there. So by all means, have a look. Um, just another link again. I, I keep flogging this. Um, Jennifer Webb, who does brilliant CPD. 
and all her profits go to a really good cause. I see today she's just donated nearly £4,000 to the Copper Feel charity, which and she's now switched to Touchstone, which is amazing. So all her profits go to charity, which is brilliant. Oh, sorry, gone too fast. No More Marking. This is a website uh, called No More Marking. And it's got some very interesting ideas about marking. But I just wanted to draw your attention to their baseline project, which is based on comparative judgment marking, which is interesting. I'm, I'm quite in favor of it. I like it, but I haven't yet worked at a school that's taken it on board. But uh, they're offering their year seven ba writing baseline project um, as a free trial. So if you'd like to have a look at it, it's certainly worth looking at the articles on there and, um, and seeing if you want to progress with that kind of thing. It's very useful for marking a standardization within departments, actually. It's a really good way of doing it. And then, oops, sorry, I keep going too fast. Jennifer Webb there, people were asking about poetry, and Jennifer Webb has a brilliant blog about unseen poetry without the stress. And she does the system that I've adopted, which is just say three things about a poem. And she's got some brilliant ideas there. So that was just for um, if, as I'm finding, we're doing poetry now at school, and the students are very hesitant and underconfident. So the, 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 the find three ideas is a good way in. Kat Howard, who we had on a couple of weeks ago, she shares everything. So if you want to link to her tweet, you can go onto her Dropbox and she's got everything in there, which is you know fantastically generous. I'm always overawed by the generosity of people on um, on Twitter. Um, and you know, quite humbled by it. But Kat's got some super stuff and, and, and it's all available there. So, you know, why reinvent the wheel? And she is the founder of Lit Drive, which again for only five pounds a year, eight five pounds a year gives you access to loads and loads and loads of brilliant resources. Okay, so that's the end of the resources. Let's move on to my stuff. So the focus is on catch up or on recall. So I've tried to cover a variety of texts, but obviously all the things I'm going to show you are adaptable for any text you might do. And you might have seen some before. If you've been with me from the very beginning, some a few of these resources I've shown you before, but I've tried to adapt them or change them slightly for this. So it is kind of a best of and uh, um, the way I'm handling catch up um, in the classroom is, is some, with some of these ideas. So hopefully you'll enjoy them. So the first one's a bit wacky. You might have tried it. I found this ages and ages ago, and I can't remember where. If anybody knows who it did come from, please let me know because I'd like to thank them. And it's um, it's pie charts for plays or books, indeed. So the idea is that you you can do any any as much scaffolding or as, as little as you want. You can give them say five themes and say pie chart that which is the most um, important theme, um, which is the least important theme. Or you can give them characters and get them to pie chart that. Or you can ask them to argue the one you've created. Do they agree with it? Or you can ask them, um, you can give them, ask them to come up with their own. You can do it with characters, you can do it with theme, you can do it with the importance of context, you can do it with all sorts of things. And it really is quite good fun, actually. So have a go. It's, it, it's, it's amusing if you do one to have them argue with it. This one I like because of, I love the idea of the walking trees. I love that. So which is the most important symbol or idea in the play? And I love the idea of the walking trees. Bad omens that everyone just ignores. I think what I like about that is it brings the play down to something, down to earth a bit, in a way that, that students don't, they tend to see sort of Shakespeare as this revered person above them. And calling it bad omens that everyone just ignores brings it down to earth a bit, makes it a little bit more understandable and approachable. So that I've had great fun with that and had some great ideas. And it, it does also, you could do it online if you wanted to, and you can do it as a homework activity that doesn't necessarily need marking, but they're in the zone, they're, they're, they're coming up with it. You can do it on scratch as well, and it works equally as well. But it's prettier with, with pie charts. So if you get any pie charts, please send them to us, um, and then we can use them in the next lot of networks. It will be really useful to see what your students come up with, actually. And yes, Linda says, really great for differentiation. It is, because this is one of those tasks, as all of them are that I'm giving you today, bar one, just, I think, accessible at any level. And they can be as detailed or not as you want them to be. OK. So you could say with that, break the bad omens down into, into smaller chunks as well. You can maybe break the trees down. Um, OK. This is obviously in spectacles. 
This is an idea I've used quite often across the board. Obviously, we've all done draw the set activities, at Blood Brothers, Inspector Calls, etc., even for Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet. But this is a different take on it, really. This is giving them a diagram. And actually, it's a recall. So you can give it to them at the very beginning of recall or, or, or revision. And you can say who sits where and why. And you can take it as far as you want, really. Obviously, you can also give them the opening of the play as a, a, an intro anyway to Inspector Calls and get them to place people. But what I like about this, this is the original first production in 1946. And they wouldn't have had a moving set then. It would have just been that set probably would have been the whole thing. They would probably have just moved the table away. So I like the idea of who would sit at the desk and when and why. Um, who would, you know, the door, or why it's there, whether the door would be better in a different place, who stands near the fireplace, that kind of thing, how the characters would move around so symbolically. Okay, um, so that that works really well for me as a, as a revision activity, actually. And you can give it out for different different acts and get, if you were able to, to do group work, which we probably won't be able to for a while. But you can give um, people one and say, do it for act one, do it for act two, do it for act three. And it does actually work quite well. You can think about as well what's on the sideboard. I did a very interesting English and Media Centre course yesterday. I don't know if anybody else did it. But it was fascinating about knowledge in English. And it approached plays like this from a much more how does a play work rather than a breaking down of the language within the play. And that was it, was, it was very much about this. It was very much approaching it as it's a play and, and what, what we talked about was, do you actually need to give any context or can you just give the opening of the play out and ask them to tell you what the context and what the ideas are? So this kind of very much ties in with it. Why would somebody, why would they have a sideboard? What would be on it? That kind of thing. So it, I, I found really good fun with this. And you can do it for Blood Brothers as well. Um, this is a very obvious one. Um, Boys Don't Cry, which is from our new diversity series, which I can thoroughly recommend actually to do at, at, at year nine or, or obviously at GCSE. It's a terrific story. I'm going to be talking more about it in the diversity conference next week. But this was a very straightforward one of um, how to recall the plot. And obviously, I've just taken some words out. But the good thing about this is you can actually use it to discuss vocabulary. And obviously, you, it, 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 it has a crossover into, into sort of English language as well. But really, what, what words would they put in there? Because in a lot of cases, I haven't just taken names out. I've actually taken other vocabulary out as well. So there might be, um, there might be choices to be made there. So what you can do, I mean, this, is, this sounds like a really obvious close activity, which, is, which, which it obviously is. But on a different level, you can use it at a higher level by giving them a plot and taking away not just not the names so that they recall the plot, but you can actually take away adjectives or verbs or, or, or other other types of, of phrases and discuss what what would be the most appropriate in terms of how tensions created, etc. OK, so that that was um, another idea. And it has worked quite well. I found it I found it good for Macbeth because you can have judgmental phrases in there and, you know, what they choose to put. It, you know, it shows their understanding of the play and how they feel tension is created or not. OK, so that's another idea. Moving on. This is something I use an awful lot, and I have used it before on one of my webinars, but this is a new one that I've done for Macbeth because I'm going to do it for a school catch-up session next week, is to give them something and correct the mistakes. Now, this works really, really well at every level as well. Because obviously, at a basic level, one one hopes that they remember that Macbeth doesn't see the ghost of Lady Macbeth. And one hopes that they remember that witches weren't thought to be holy. OK. But what it does is gives you, I give them that in the middle of an A3 sheet if I'm in school. OK. But I would maybe ask them just to make notes on a piece of paper if they were at home. Correct them. But also take it further. Tell me why it's so wrong. OK. So Macbeth kills Macduff. Um, you know, why is it wrong? What does happen? Um, and I've dropped a context one in there in the hope that they might then take that further and, and actually link it to, to something in the play. OK, so that, that has worked quite well for me um, for every text I've done. But that was, that was particularly for Macbeth. And again, it, you, if you, the more paper you give, the more they have to fill in. 
and they can do it for each other as well. That works well in the classroom. It might be a little bit difficult going forward. But I found it works really well if you say to them, there's your grid. You put the mistakes in and you swap it with a partner. Um, and it's interesting because actually some of mine put the correct thing in thinking it was a mistake. So it highlighted some misunderstandings. And you can say, correct the mistakes in theme, correct the mistakes in context. OK, so it, it, that worked really well, actually, across the board and has lots of different uses. Something that you, if you've been with me from the very beginning, you'd have seen this before, but it pays to show it again because it's been the most popular, and that's my solar white space activity. So if you haven't have seen this before, bear with me. Otherwise, um, if you haven't, I'll explain it to you. This is something I devised as a homework last year because my students just, whatever I did, just didn't seem to recall the plot. And without the plot, they were unable to answer the part two questions for Shakespeare or for Jekyll and Hyde. So all I did, because I wanted a homework that was no mark and less hassle for teachers to do, so I came up with this idea. The idea being that I've just dumped from the internet the plot of um, Macbeth on the sheet. And I can change that box that says Lady Macbeth is a ruthless character into whatever I want. I can put um, ambition, as you see on the next one, I can put um, a character name in there. And they fill the white space with ideas to, again, various degrees. But the, the main thing is that they can't just underline the whole of Act 1 and say, this shows superstition. They have to select a very specific part of the text. So I'll show you an example. And this was, the, unbelievably, with my um, quite difficult year 11, sort of four or five borderline class, the most popular homework they ever had. And here's one completed by a lovely, lovely girl called Paris, who loves to color code. Unfortunately, I don't think the color coding is anything more than a desire to use all her lovely new pens. But it gives you an idea. And even, you don't, even if you don't mark it, even if all they do is read it and write a few things in, at least they're recalling the plot every single week. And what I did was I did one for uh, Macbeth and one for Jekyll and Hyde, and I used to back-to-back -back them, so their homework was two. So it, it's no mark. I used to make them bring it in and have a look at it, and I would just sign the corner to show that I'd seen it. And they kept them in a folder as well, so they had them as revision activities. And all you've got to do as a teacher is just change that title every week. Um, Sarah says, this is brilliant. I used this with my year 10s and a Christmas carol before some assessments in April and their results were great. Thank you. Yeah, it has been overwhelmingly the most popular resource I've ever, I've ever shared. Um, and, it, and it was born out of desperation. How could I get them to do it? And, and at, at the end of at Christmas, I, I started teaching them in September. And by Christmas, I said to them, what was the most helpful thing that I've given you so I can know for next year? And they said, we didn't like it to start with, but we loved the homework every week, and we liked writing an essay once a week. So what I used to do was to give them that on a Tuesday, as I had them Tuesday, Wednesday, give them that on a Tuesday, and then the following week on the Tuesday, we planned an essay, and the Wednesday they wrote it. And so I did have an essay to mark every week, but they used this as a pre-planning activity. So I'd say the following week, okay, ambition then, here's the question. Now we'll move to an extract. So the Tuesday we did the extract, and then they at least had have, have got something ready for part two, which was great. And they found it really, really helpful. And they loved writing an essay. So, you know, there you go. And Jenny says, fantastic sequence of learning. It was, I have to say, it was the most transformative sequence of learning I've done. And it got to the point, the first one, on the first Wednesday they were writing an essay, there was, oh, you name it, what pen shall I use? What paper shall I use? Shall I do it in my book? I'm not ready. I need to go to the toilet. I need a drink. I don't like sitting here. He's noisy. The usual stuff. Um, unbelievably, four weeks later, they all came in ready and got their books out and were disappointed if it wasn't an essay. So it's worth persevering. They're, they became creatures of habit. So you can do that for any text. And if you go on our resources website, you'll find that there is a PowerPoint lesson for Inspector Calls, Jekyll and Hyde, and A Christmas Carol, all of which have the plot in this format that you could use. So you don't even have to make it. It's just the resource that keeps on giving. Um, and here's another. Um, somebody said like, we call them brain dumps. Yeah, here you go. Here's another dump idea. So that really is to recall the plot. Now let's think about how character works with plot. Okay, let's get a bit more sophisticated. So 
how does Sheila develop over the course of the play? So here's the plot of Inspector Calls. And what I did was to say, okay, here you go. Here's your homework. Or here's a recall in the classroom. How can you fill that white space and pick out only the parts of the play that you think are relevant to Sheila developing? Now, again, this is this can be done at any level because obviously Sheila develops from being somebody naive and innocent who's excited about her ring. Oh, mummy, look at my ring. To somebody who, in the end, is incredibly scornful of her parents at the end. So that, and at a very basic level, or, you know, they can take it further. They can start adding in links to theme. They can start adding in links to context. Okay, so I found that works incredibly well. And here's one, here's one that I did earlier. Um, and this is, this was, again, to build up to a Sheila essay. This was the one, this is one I did, I used in the PowerPoint lesson that I did for Pearsons, but also one that I made in the classroom for a model, just to say, look, you know, it's got to be this detailed. I've also added in, in green there, something of my own, because you can say to students, if there's, if there's something missing from the plot that you think should be there, add it in. Don't just stick with what I've put, okay? Um, Joanna said, has anyone got a link to that? I assume by that, I'm not sure what you mean, Joanna. If you could put what you mean in the group chat, then I'll see if I can get it for you. I'll see if we can find the link. And so that's that one then. Another one, uh, moving on to theme, is this is in, um, a Christmas carol. So here you go. You've already got the, the slide for a Christmas carol if you want to do exactly the same thing with that as I did with the Macbeth. This is in quite some detail. It works best on A3 if you're going to use it in the classroom. But I found they found A3 a bit frightening for homework. One girl said, I can't fit it in my bag. So I folded it for her. But A4 proved to be less threatening for uh, a difficult class for homework. So with this one, you can give it like this or this. Fill this white space with ideas about where themes are reflected in the plot. Um, Joanna says the inspector calls and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde white spaces. I didn't quite catch where they are. Um, they are, I hope Pam or Liz will put that on there because they are our PowerPoint lessons, um, which is where they are. So if Pam or Liz could put the link up for you, that would help. So here's an idea here. There's some themes and how they link, again, demonstrated. And this comes from, the again, the PowerPoint lessons that are available for you online. Okay, so this is just an example. But you can see that with all these, they, ha they have linked to a very specific part of the, of the play or book. So if you're working with any exam board, actually, it isn't enough just to say um, greed shown in the book because everybody, Scrooge is greedy. They need to say specifically where. So this gets them to narrow down to a specific part of the plot. And if the part they want to use isn't there, they can add it in. Um, Liz has put the link up there for you. Okay, so next one. Here is a more detailed one. This is for Boys Don't Cry by Mallory Blackman. And you can see I've squashed the plot down the bottom and I've given some themes and I've given some names. Okay, so they can link to, they, what, what the idea being here, that if you are writing an essay about tolerance, for instance, to get your idea that the planning stage, you can think about how tolerance is shown through characters and how it's shown through the plot. So, for instance, um, on this, tolerance is shown, or, or a lack of tolerance is shown when Dante doesn't stand up for his brother. He, he, he doesn't um, stand up for him when um, Adam is, is teased about his sexuality. So he shows intolerance. So that, that links to both the clear plot line and also to, to Dante himself. So you're being, they're being specific about where it happens in the plot, and they're also clearly linking it to a character. And again, if it was a character question, you can link, how does Adam link to the um, themes? And how does he link to a very specific part of the plot? And also, um, how does he react to other characters? Because that's another thing that's often missed out. At the higher level, is students will write about one character for the post-1914 and forget that they are also shown in how they react to other, and what other people think of them. Okay, so that, that's particularly true in the novels. So that's, that's why I include everything. And it works really well. Okay, moving on. Context now. Oh, there's a, there's a filled-in one. 
just as an example. Moving on to context. Now, context is a, is a, a bit of a bugbear of mine because I don't really, it's too many students just bolt it on on the end and I want, to, I want to try and work on making it a lot more dynamic. And I talked the week before last about valuing what students bring to the party. And so I've carried on with that. So here is another way of doing it. And this again is the plot of Boys Don't Cry. And because it's a modern novel and because it covers a lot of current themes, I thought, well, why tell them the themes? Why not get them to pick it out of the summary? So what do you feel about any of the issues raised here? What experience do you have of any of the issues? So obviously, you, you need to be sensitive if you did this in the classroom. You, you need to stress that they don't have to share their personal experiences. But it, it covers um, you know, a lot of issue, a lot of current issues, um, single families, the welfare state, um, homophobia, teenage pregnancy, um, fatherhood, lots of issues are there. So instead of telling them and giving them dry context, actually get them to weed it out, get them to tell you what they know already, because then they have a much more personal response. And I found that's worked really well. And sometimes I might even do that in advance of even reading the book, the, you know, they know what's coming and they've thought about it. So that's one way of doing it. And here's another way for doing it for Inspector Calls. Um, there's a little write-up there about Inspector Calls. So what do you know about any of this? How is your experience of life different to that of Eva or the Burling? Because I saw a thread on Twitter earlier about what's the most ridiculous misunderstanding you've had of a contextual idea. Um, and, you know, craft statements like um, all women, uh, women just sat at home and did what the husband said. It's that kind of all women, all men. Rather than coming to it, don't tell them any context. Get them to actually tell you what they already know, and then it becomes a lot more real. They're owning it a lot more. So, for instance, they could read that and think, well, that isn't what my life is like. That, that isn't, I, I don't know anything about that. Or they could say, oh, hold on a minute. On the second paragraph, Sheila used her status as a valued customer, for instance, to have Eva dismissed. So who would be a valued customer now? Who would be able to use that kind of status? I'm th always thinking there of the scene in Pretty Woman where she comes back into the shop with the bags and says, big mistake. But again, actually relating it to things like that makes it a lot more understandable rather than having it as a context that sits over there in a box. It then becomes real rather than actually teaching them context uh, as a kind of research project at the beginning. I hope that makes sense. Um, next one is this is a, a one I've shared before, but just to remind her here that, again, another way of teaching context is to give them a grid here with, that's nine ideas. And once they've read a little bit of the book, to link it to the book, or to give them that in advance and ask them what they know. Okay, so for instance, what is their, what, how do they feel about it? How do they feel about the fact that, for instance, social norms have changed? I found this um, on a website. In the early 2000s, a lot of young female role models were having, were getting pregnant. So this led to a, a, it was a mark of status to get pregnant. And now it's considered totally uncool. Do they agree? Do they agree? How do they feel about it? Um, how do they feel about masculinity being in crisis? Is it? Does it have any relevance to them? Can they think of an example? So this can be a pre-teaching idea. Rather than teaching them the content, so getting them to go and look it up and all they do is dump you a Wikipedia thing and, and pretend it's not even though it's still got the underlining in it. Um, I just found this is a more useful way. It's actually a discussion in the classroom. Discuss rather than tell. Um, so, for instance, what do they feel about reading a book that is the, the, the Guardian said is an adroit investigation of modern family relations very clearly portrayed? What does that make them expect? Um, the bottom left-hand corner, I need to tell you that because um, we can't use brand names, I will get you to think about this didn't originally say famous dark stout drink. It said a brand name. In 1995, this brand name, made in Dublin, hard to guess, had been due to run a commercial directed by Tony Kaye featuring two men kissing to the sound of Tammy Wynette's Stand By Your Man, but it was cancelled. So again, how do they feel about that? Should that kind of thing be cancelled? Let's see what they know before we 
we, we prejudge. And then they bring their own feelings to the book and they actually start to engage with the characters in a lot more meaningful way. So that could be adapted for, for any. And in fact, um, I've done it for Corin Boy as well, another one of our ones on the diversity spec. Um, here's one filled in. I'm going to have to hurry now. I didn't realize the time. Um, here's one filled in when they've read the book. Okay, this is how they would link it very specifically to the characters rather than using it as a dump test. And also the idea that they don't have to own every one of those boxes. You know, not all of those contexts will be relevant at every point. Let's be specific. Um, just that really covers my ideas there for catch up on the um, plot, theme, characters, etc. Now, just to show you a couple of ideas on extracts. Um, and it's there. This is again another one I've shown you before. If you haven't been on my webinars before or you didn't come to this one, this again was probably the second most popular. And I've had lots of, we've had lots of versions sent into us and people have said it's transformed their answers. So this is a pre-activity for extracts. And I've put the seldom used speech by Malcolm at the end of the play here. And the idea being they summarize it because they often dive in, you know, and found a metaphor or a simile in the, in the 14th line without really understanding what the speech even said. So they don't even understand it. So it's the idea of summarize it first, then describe Malcolm, then find things, then crunch the speech means um, take the most important word out of each line. I often say choose six lines that you can work with and choose me a word from each one. So you've got the summarize, suggest they understand the whole holistically before they dive in. They have to do that first. Describe is breaking it down. What three things could you say in answer to the question? Find gives them a little bit of support. It's never feature spotting though. And then crunch is like, right, that's now, now you understand it. Now you're allowed to go into word level, not until you understand it. So that, so useful, um, Sarah says, to engage, encourage understanding. Again, it has transformed some of my students' writing again. Um, so there you go, you've heard it from a user there. And I've used it with great success, it's brilliant. Um, and can be adapted for anything. So please take that, adapt it, dump it in and, and send them to us. Now, using the same speech, here's some things for right higher level, okay? The idea being that instead of just standing and annotating and telling them the answers, they find something out for themselves. So this is from the British Library website. And I've put the link there in the, in the PowerPoint. This again is Malcolm's speech. Um, language, form and structure. How does Shakespeare present Malcolm in this scene? So I give, you give them nothing. The idea is that they have this as a big maybe A3 sheet. They use that, that lecture or that, that um, essay on the left hand side to inform their analysis of the right hand side. So it's really giving them a lot more ownership. So you've got, I mean, obviously the previous, um, the previous resource works at any level, but this is probably a little bit higher. And I've used those with quite some success on, uh, for remote learning actually, for the much, much brighter students um, in my top set year 10. Not all of them could handle it, but those that did, did get a lot from it and felt very important that they were reading um, proper essays, that they, they felt really important with that. And, and it, it, it often validates a lot of what you say. It's like, oh, proper people at the British Library thought it. It must be right. Okay, so that, that really is going on extract. Then I'm just very quickly going to whistle stop through something on poetry because I realise that I haven't done much on poetry for a while. And, it's not about analysis of poetry, it's just something that a colleague of mine, Emma Clark, produced, again for our PowerPoint lesson on poetry, but it's so, I've used it in the classroom and it's so useful and simple a way of building a comparison, it's, it's, it's changed my life. So let's have a look. So there's poem one. Now, if you can imagine this as a big A3 sheet with the other poem on the right, that's how I want you to imagine it, but I couldn't fit it onto the PowerPoint. So they start with poem one, and let's say it was um, compare the uh, representation or the, the, how war is presented, okay? So they read poem one, and they come up with three points, and they write them down in those boxes, and they put the evidence, and they put relevant context, but only a little bit at the bottom. And here's an example, okay? But then they have the second poem on the other side, 
And I did it this week with um, two war poems. I had the three columns in the middle and the poems on either side. And it worked brilliantly. Uh, a fairly weak class was able to come up with three definite points. Um, one shows the mental after effects of war. One shows the violence of war. Uh, and a third point was, I think, they both used structure to show the horror of war. So they had three clear points. They were able to bring the evidence into the middle. Job, jobs are good. And they only allowed a tiny bit of context. They didn't add it on. Um, and it worked brilliantly. So that, that's a little idea for you. Um, and that, I think, it doesn't seem to have taken long. But that's it. We're into tea break time. So I hope those ideas were useful. I'm going to go to tea break now. So if you haven't been with us before, now you're going to be put into a group uh, with other people. One Pearson person will be with you. It's your chance to share, inspire, and um, really just talk about what you've seen, whether you're going to adapt it, other ideas you've got along the same lines, okay? And we usually do that for about five minutes. So I'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. Hiya. Hello. Hi, everybody. We're back. Um, do you want to start, Liz? Um, yep. So everyone was very positive about the filling in the blank space that you shared, Julie. So that's gone down really well, and people want to use that. Um, a suggestion um, about a well-known restaurant task. <laughs> so you pick out the menu. <laughs> Mild to extra hot. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So then you you give the different tasks based on that, and I think someone sent that in actually at they Pam before. Yes. It rings a bell. Yes. I thought so. Um, and then other people looking for nineteenth century text support with very low ability groups. So, um, possibly sort of sharing some ideas about that as well. Okay, lovely. Katie, what about you? Nice to see you. Hiya. Um, yeah, we had some oh, good yeah. ideas coming out of our group. Um, so um, an activity called Five a Day as a kind of starter for the lesson where um, basically it's kind of five key questions for the students to reflect on um, as a way of kind of identifying any misconceptions or any kind of knowledge gaps that they might have. And some people are saying that the kids can get quite competitive about it, which is quite a bit of, bit of fun. Um, and um, a good idea called Who Said What to Whom? So providing um, some key quotations from the um, from the book or the play or whatever, and the students have got to work out who said it and who they said it to, which I thought was um, quite a fun way of helping to revise. Um, and someone mm -hmm. mentioned as well, um, they kind of set up what they call training programs um, for their for their set text. So basically, it's kind of ten tasks per text, so that the students can kind of select from that which ones they want to focus on, give them a bit of ownership. Yeah, good idea. I like the ownership idea. Thanks, Katie. Um, Pam? It's a bit embarrassing in my room to start off with because I was nattering away and then somebody went and typed in, I think it was Nick or someone, Pam, we can't hear you. We think you're on mute. Oh, dear. Ah. Anyway, we've got there in the end. So, um, Hannah made a really good point, um, made a really, uh, talked about a really, made a good point. Um, <laughs> she said that she works in a grammar school and what they've done, one of the things they've done which worked really well was get the class to read a critical article um, about a scene in a play or a, you know or a text something from a text get them to read it and then after that they have to write their own critical uh, piece about a different part of the play or the text I thought that was a really good idea actually um, I like that. yeah I haven't heard that one before and people were saying in general you know they like the the things they've seen today and just things like that and someone was talking about connection maps um, I didn't have enough time to write that down because we left the room but yeah it was interesting so that was good. Oh, good, good. Well, I had a couple of interesting ones. One was, um, and I'd love to do this, I, 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 it takes me back to the days when we had more time. Someone did a full-on Lego photo animation oh, yeah. of one of these things. I can't remember what play it was. I didn't see that, but it, fabulous idea. Good. Um, good. Somebody said they'd used the context grid. They'd used it to give um, contextual points about two poems, and they had to link um, to the poems, which was good. Um, and an interesting, um, an interesting analysis here of, of Eva in an Inspector Cause came out of a discussion we were having, which was that a student had said to, to them that, um, that each character sees their own version of Eva, ah, which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. It makes me think that 
it made me think that also as an audience we also see our own version of Eva yeah, don't we yeah that's a good point mm. so how, how much you you lay your own ideas and that's that makes me as well think about context is if you do do context in a more real way valuing what students bring to it they have more insight into actually who Eva is because she is a different person to all of us I thought that was quite deep really. it is actually especially for this time of day as well I think that's really interesting good one to use I thought that I thought that was lovely very deep um, people are sharing there on the group chat where you can find these five a days and yes I agree Matt Lynch and Stuart Price are massive massive sources of things like that so sign up to Lit Drive um, and Team English yeah absolutely okay so moving on then because we are coming towards the end um, Shared resources, Pam? Are we still waiting? Yeah. We've got some already in I mind, can, haven't Yeah, we? I can say something about that. Um, as you know, it's great when you send in your shared resources. Um, and we've put some online. Obviously, you know where that is to access. The link comes up on the slides, as it always yeah. does. There it is. That's the one. Um, but apart from that, if you've got any other things you'd like to send in, because you know we do the fortnightly draw. So because next week is not the same as norm, well, it's a different, it's a diversity online event in, instead. So if the following week is our normal one, which is the 16th of July, I can't talk, sorry. So July the 16th, we're going to be doing our final one, which is looking ahead and, you know, the usual top tips, etc. from Julie. But on that one, if you, we'll be doing the £25 draw on that week. So if you've got any other resources you want to send in, or as I and Julie were talking about earlier on, any of the resources you've seen with us that you've adapted, you know, send them to me. Because obviously, the more you send, the better it is, and we can share them, which is great. So that would be fantastic for the draw. There it is. There. Um, yeah. If you've already used like that context idea, yeah. whoever gave me that one with the context with the poems, using the context group, get them in. You know, let let's get them shared. Anybody that's adapted them, I'd love to see that. That would be brilliant. Yeah. Just send them. If you haven't been with us before, there's the email address on screen now. The full English at Pearson.com. That would be brilliant. Yep, and if you do want to just okay. pop the next slide, Julie, for the weekly draw. Yep, okay, go. so as you know, there's a feedback draw. There's a feedback, sorry, survey at the end of every week we do. And when you fill that in, your name goes into a draw for a £10 voucher. So today, I have it here. Let's quickly do it. Well, I, hope we know, I hope we've got the winner with it. Drum roll. That would be good because I don't think we did last week, did we? And the winner today mm -hmm. is because I can't say your surname due to copyright or not copyright, but, you know, data. The name is David H. So, David, if you are there, can you just type in the group chat box to show us that you're here? And um, you've won the £10 voucher this week. So don't. Was it Rosa who won last week without being here, or was oh, it...? Uh, yeah, there's Nick. Nick won last week. Yeah. Oh, he's the one last week. Rosa. Rosa. Sorry, yeah, Nick, yeah. Here, so I noticed Rosa is back Rosa with now. us. Yeah, yeah that's Nick it. Was, well, everyone's yeah. winning. This Excellent. is great. David's with us, brilliant. So he's got this. Oh, fabulous. David, there he so is. Make lovely. Sure you fill your feedback in. Yes, yeah, so and make sure. If you don't, Sorry, go on. You can't, no, if you don't enter, you can't win. So please do the feedback at the end. And you've seen from the beginning that I do read all the feedback and I do try and. Obviously, I've only, as, as I'll come to, I've only got one more proper session. So if we just go through that, what we've got, um, we have got next week is. Yeah, you tell them a bit about next week, well, Tom, because it's really exciting. Next week is going to be, well, every week is exciting, but this is even more exciting. Um, it's going to be on for two hours, so hopefully you can join us. We were in a room up to 500 people, but we've, we're have we too big for the room now, basically. Story of my life, no, I'm joking. So now we've got a bigger <laughs> room, up to 1,000, and we're on about 700 people at the minute. So please, you know, if you've got colleagues that would be interested, oh, good, someone's laughing at my jokes. That's Katie, that's good. Um, I pay her to laugh at my jokes, that's okay. No, sorry, hey, where were we? So yeah, special guest, Benjamin Zephaniah, it's going to be amazing. And we're going to have, Julie's going to be there talking about integrating um, new text into curriculum for diversity. We're going to have a couple of people from schools talking about how they've made their curriculum more diverse. It's going to be really, really fantastic. It's really exciting. And as I say, it's on for two hours, four to six. So if you haven't already signed up, please get on there and sign up, register for it. So it's going to be really, really good. Over to you again. Yeah, Jenny. people are saying, yeah, people are saying they're in. Jenny's in. Brilliant. Nick says he's got a few others coming. Well, I'm going to basically talk through um, the diverse texts that we've got on, and then I'm going to give some ideas about how to teach them. So Fabulous. Because uh, all of them, if you don't take them on as a new GCSE text, you could do them in year nine for Key Stage 3, so there's some fantastic texts. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to telling you about those. That would be great. Right, I'm going to go and now. Then, I'm going to switch off my screen and leave you to it. Thanks, Pam. 
And then after that, 16th of July, it's the last one. It's language, looking ahead to 2021. That's, we're going to end on that note. We've already got, I think, about 150 people booked on. So, But it, there are still spaces because we've got a big room for that day. So it's the final one, really. So again, I'm going to do a sort of a best of. I'm going to find a really brilliant text to use as well, actually. Um, yeah, something from the past, okay? So um, if there's anything you specifically want, do um, email. Otherwise, I will just sort of do the best of and, and, and try and do a bit of a roundup and looking ahead to 2021. Oh, Rosa says I won't be able to attend the last one. I'm in school. Oh, that's such a shame. I'm sorry about that, Rosa. You've been with nearly everyone. That's a shame. Um, extra sessions as well. Please do publicise these. Um, on the 14th of July, I'm going to do a special section for NQ NQTs. Now, I'm not intending to do the – it's not going to be just – how to survive, because I think there's a lot of books out there that will, 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 that will tell NQTs how to survive and give them tips and that kind of thing. What I'm intending to do is just a little bit of that, but what I want to do as well is share all the wizzy bangy funny resources that I've picked up over the years um, that, that aren't really subject specific either. They could be adapted for other subjects. So all sorts of things I've picked up over the years that are fun and that will arm NQTs to go into the classroom and be able to face their classes because I'm aware that they haven't had as much time in the classroom as they should have done. So just really about confidence. So any NQTs you know, do tell them. And then on the 15th of July, I'm going to be doing a Heads of Department one, and I've got Becky Cowley from Chase Terrace School joining me. And she's going to tell you about an Ofsted deep dive and other things, and I'm going to be talking about um, things like well-being and marking and that kind of thing. So really, but really, it's intended to be as much a networking session as it is a me talking. There's going to be much bigger networking, um, much longer networking. So it's a really good opportunity to get in touch with some other heads of department and build up some contacts to take you through what's going to be another challenging year. Every year is challenging, but but next year is going to bring its own particular set of challenges. So it'd be really good to have you there. So, um, yeah, they're open to sign up now. We've got quite a lot already on each one, but again, they're big rooms, I think, so we've got the space. Um, Joanna says, how do we sign up for the heads one? Um, there, should be, there should be a link in. I think the link for this one, that will have it on. I'm almost sure. Yeah, in the usual place. So follow that link on that one, and you will also be able to get on the heads one and the NQT one. Okay. And if there is anything specific you want to cover, um, can Key Stage 3 coordinators sign up for the head of department? I mean, yes, you can. It's not, you know, it's, it's not kind of exclusive membership, but it, it, it is very much not about specific English teaching resources. It is much more about um, about actually running a department. Okay, so it, if you think that would be relevant, then, then by all means, please come along. And NQTs do share it with other NQTs in, in, in other departments because, you know, worst way that they can, that they're going to go away with a couple of resources they can adapt and build up a network of people. Again, that's always important, isn't it? Particularly going forward, I think it's really important because I think one of the things that, that, that worried me most about the government plans, I think, or made me saddest was the idea that um, staff rooms aren't going to be what they were. And that, and that made me really sad. I've been lucky this last year to work in a school where Everybody sat down, only in the English department, granted, but everybody sat down in the English workroom for um, about half an hour at lunchtime. And at some point, all of us would have been there chatting, sharing, sharing food, sharing recipes, talking about telly and just generally chilling out. And I think uh, we need that to recreate that online if we're going to be, if it's going to be a little strange in school. OK, so. Moving on, what can we do to help? Yes, Sarah Brown said, I miss it. I do terribly, actually. I, I really miss that, that contact with people in the real world. I miss that contact with you, actually, because I used to be able to get out and about and, um, and get to people's schools, and I don't know how soon that's going to happen. Although, do please ask me. Um, there you've got a link to the updates. Um, there you've got a link. Those free online lessons for Year 10 students, um, are you can still access the PowerPoints and use them. And they're very, very good. Um, knowledge organisers are up now for the four new texts. So if you are thinking of teaching them, have a look at the knowledge organisers. See if you think the content appeals to you. OK, so as if nothing else, these give you a starting point from which to plan a scheme of work. Um, secondary resources, the usual link. There's our text. Um, 
if you can help with research, please do. Um, Claire, our subject advisor, and ending on there's a uh, if you're not if you're new to LXO and you want to find out more about us. And then we've got the feedback. Sorry, so I'm going to really, really end quickly. Um, yeah. I meant to put a slide in there, but we didn't do it. I forgot about it. Um, the, um, if you're a head of department, or you know you've got an influence with your head of department, head teacher, whatever, about the marking of the mocks program that we've got, the mock market. Would you just want to mention oh, that, or yeah. shall I just do it? So go it's ahead, a new please, scheme that Pearson have introduced, and basically you can pay to get your mocks marked, but there's different levels depending on whether you want the mocks marked um, and all the feedback or whether you just want. There's different levels. It's difficult for me to explain on here, but basically there's a new service that we're offering about mocks marking, and it's really good. It's had a lot of um, really, really good reviews, and people have said it's great apparently. So if you're interested in that, then please you know, go ahead and do it. I'll find the link in a minute and type it in there for you. Sorry, Julie. No, that's okay. We'll, we'll, I'll remember. We must put a slide in that in the not in the diversity one, but in the final one I do, and particularly the heads of department one. We must put a slide in that so that people yeah. can, if, you know, if they um, if they don't attend, that they can see it later, because that's a really really good resource. I think, particularly going into a year where I think it's going to be quite worrying. Um, you know, it, it, we're all going to be very busy, so any any support you can get on that would be brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to sign off now. Thanks ever so much. I do hope I'll see you all at the last one on the 16th, and I really hope I'll see you at the diversity one. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about that, so please say something nice and friendly to me because I'm going on after Benjamin Zephaniah is a little <laughs> bit intimidating. So I really hope to see some friendly faces.